Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 81st episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. My friends know me as JAG. I'm the CEO of the Atlas Society, which is the leading nonprofit introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways. Today, we are joined, I, I guess I could say rejoined, by a very good friend of mine, uh, Jeffrey Tucker. Um, going to introduce him. Most of you already know him, but I also want to remind you, we're going to really try to get to your questions. So watching us on Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, just use the comment section and type them in. Please make them short and get to as many of them as possible. So this man who needs no introduction, Jeffrey Tucker, he is the founder and president of the Brownstone Institute, uh, which he founded in May of this year to promote reason, science, and enlightenment values in the face of the extraordinarily authoritarian um, and destructive global response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, together with his distinguished faculty, including Jay Bhattacharya and Mar Martin Koldorf, Jeffrey has tirelessly, tirelessly criticized lockdowns and mandates while promoting focused protection for the vulnerable. He is the author of uh, eight books, I believe, in five languages, the most recent of which is this one, Liberty or Lockdowns, which explores the unprecedented economic devastation uh, and civil liberty violations resulting from the governmental response to the pandemic. Jeffrey. Jennifer, it's so nice to see you. And thanks uh, so much for your tireless work. And my goodness, 81 episodes you said. It's just incredible. Uh, you're just out there all the time. It's like my entire internet feed is just Jennifer Grossman out of the society. That's it. <laughs> well, <laughs> good. You know, we've got a good division of labor. You're right. Well, you know, actually, Jennifer, let me say something else, uh, because if, if you don't mind, um, when lockdowns happen, there is a real question, and there shouldn't have been. Uh, but the question was, like, who's going to be against them? Who's going to be silent? And who's going to be for them? Um, and I must say, you know, it, it didn't surprise me, but it gratified me enormously to see that you and the Atlas Society were, were really on the forefront of fighting the, the biggest attacks on, on, on uh, liberty in our, in our lifetimes. Um, and you never flinched. You were, you were relentless. And I'm sure you got criticism for it. You know, I'm, I'm feel sure, probably even from your board or donors. I don't know, but you took the right view. You've been out there and you've been, we've been relatively alone throughout this whole thing, but you were right and you were ferocious and, and Ayn Rand would have been uh, absolutely proud of you because there's so much of the world in which we, which you saw emerging in which we live right now that is straight out of Atlas Front, you know? And, yeah. and, and you, you used your platform to fight for, for truth, uh, for principle, and for uh, human rights, and for human liberties at a time when too many people stayed silent. So do you deserve congratulations for that and support and recognition, which you won't get, but uh, nonetheless, you took a principled position, just like the great characters in Atlas Shrugged. So uh, congratulations to you. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's really important to, as Ayn Rand would say, to integrate your, your values with your emotions and with your behavior. And to me, uh, this was the position with integrity. I yeah. felt terrible. I felt it. I felt the brunt of it being here in uh, California. Yeah. Um, but I also took a lot of cues uh, from you. Mm. And uh, also from Ayn Rand, she was, she was pretty unequivocal when she said, you know, in terms of a government role for inoculation, she said there should not be a government role if the inoculation is practicable and desirable, those who want it will take it. Yeah, those well, God bless not go along will only be a danger to themselves because everybody else will be um, will be inoculated. Sure. So, but there's also uh, the, the strange thing that the lockdowns themselves reminded me so much of this. Who's that? Who's that bureaucrat in Atlas Shrugged who like 
wanted the economy just to go back to the way it was before, just do the same things this year that you were doing last year, you know, under the executive order or whatever, whatever. And uh, it lockdowns were very much like that, right? It was like a straight, uh, straight out of fiction. You know, the bureaucrats who don't understand the interrelationship between economic functioning and human choice and human freedom, right? You know, they just think of the economy as just a big machine that just kind of goes and every, everybody should just acquiesce to this machine without seeing Rand's point that no, economics is really about the things that we do and the things that we build and the things that we choose uh, and the values you know, that we have. And so when you have a government just shutting down human choice, you're, you're gonna shut down not, not just you know, economic productivity or prosperity, but civilization. Right, so it's it's a profound threat to everything we've worked to build over 500 years, I would say, and certainly uh, it, it run, flies in the face of everything Rand stood for, which was you know human choice and individualism and the right to uh, to use the opportunities around you to build a good life. And you have the, you know people like Anthony Fauci or whatever or Deborah Burks to say no, you can't do that anymore uh, because we we tell you you can't. Uh, because we've uh, judged this pathogen to be uh, too dangerous. And we have a plan for you. Your job is to, to, is to submit to the collective will, all right? So, so to me, this is like, you know, Rand forecasted this like perfectly and you channeled her, you know, uh, as you've done so much in your life uh, to, to be the voice for her during a crisis uh, that she didn't experience in her lifetime, but she had prepared us for this, I think. But still, even though she prepared us for it, we need voices for the philosophy she represents uh, to, to be active. And it makes a huge difference. I mean, the difference you've made is immense because, you know, um, the people like Fauci and Burks and the rest of them want to believe that, that they're in charge of history, uh, but it's not really true. I mean, the people who are in charge of history who are, are those who are actively engaged in it and, and out there in the, in the battle of ideas, you know? Um, history is nothing but the, the fulfillment of the things we believe. So, so you've been very active in, in helping people believe something different, which is like, it's, it's wrong. My rights matter more than your um, fears, grief, you know, or your fears. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, well, you had, had a wonderful quote, which we, uh, it was actually, I think it was a Von Mises quote about when civilization is sweet. Could you, cause I, we named yeah, it. Yeah. But I, no, I no. It's a, so this is actually very interesting because like, you have to think about Mises in 1922. So he, he's, it's a very interesting time in his life because he was just a plain academic and say 10 years earlier, it's just a monetary theorist and a very mainstream sort of guy and a culturated Jew in Austria uh, writing about monetary economics and nobody thought anything about it. But, uh, but the rise of the socialists, you know, after, after uh, World War I and the crisis of the Weimar inflation and everything start, started giving rise to extremism all over uh, interwar Europe. And, and, um, and the socialists were, um, you know, we're not talking about like socialists of the 1880s in Britain, you know, like Oscar Wilde drinking absinthe, all right? We're talking about like ferocious people who wanted to overthrow all uh, freedoms and human rights and, and, and property rights and, and enterprises as we knew it. And so he writes this book called Socialism, uh, where he just, you know, tears apart the whole fabric of the theoretical structure. And right at the end, he says something very interesting. He says, he says, when civilization... Uh, uh, he says, when civilization is sweeping towards destruction, uh, there is no safe place for anyone. Uh, therefore, it is the moral obligation of every citizen to throw himself into the intellectual battle uh, to save you know, that which we, we love. And I remember when I first read that, I was probably you know, like a young man, I thought, it's like sometimes when you read 1984, when you're young, you think that'll never happen. This is, <laughs> this is overwrought. This is going way too far. And so when I read that, 
that 1922 quote from Mises, I thought, well, this is just really going too far. You know, it's like, come on, when is civilization really sweeping towards destruction? But look, you know, this is 1922, uh, uh, Austria. Uh, uh, 10 years later, uh, you had the Nazi youth marching in the street, calling for, you know, uh, blaming the Jews for, for all existing problems and, 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 and inventing problems to blame on the Jews. You know, so it was, you know, there, there was a sense of like social cooperation was collapsing. Uh, the money had collapsed. Uh, uh, the culture had collapsed. Uh, the cultural institutions had fallen apart. Uh, academia was being systematically purged. So in 1934, so 12 years after he wrote that quote about civilization uh, sweeping towards destruction, he had to leave. And he found a safe space for himself in Geneva, where he really used his time very well. But, uh, but he was a, a kind of a prophet. And I have to tell you, Jennifer, I've been, I wonder if you would say the same thing. I think I've been naive most of my life, actually. I, I always thought that freedom was more robust, that our institutions could withstand any kind of attacks, that the woke crowd, the crazy people were just in academia and they didn't really matter. And, uh, and mostly what we're doing is engaging in parlor games and debates with our friends, but that we would never face like, like a crisis of civilization. And then March, 2020 happened. And, um, and you suddenly realize that it can happen. Disaster is, is not that far away. It's like, like Lord Acton always said about, about, um, about freedom that it's like some sort of it's like a fragile, a fragile thing, like a fragile ornament can be easily be crushed. And uh, I, think, I think we've lived through that. We felt it. Mises lived through that. But the great thing about Mises was that he saw that the way to fight back was by um, adhering to principle, uh, clinging to truth, having the moral courage to say what is right, even when everybody's against you, even when you're banned, even when you're censored, even when you're surrounded by colleagues who tell you you're an idiot, you still have to have the, the moral intuition to say to see what's right and the courage to, to say it at that, that critical time. Sometimes it's a tiny minority that does it, right? And I think you felt that way you know, in the early days, like, why am I so alone? But look at the difference you've made. Um, I didn't want to live in these times. You didn't want to live in these times. But for whatever reason, we've been presented this right now. And we have to use everything we know, everything we've learned, all of our experiences. We didn't read Atlas Shrugged for entertainment, right? It it was entertaining. But we learned it to feed our souls, to give us a spirituality of strength, of courage, uh, to stand up when these times uh, would come. We didn't want them to come, but they are here. Now is the time. So I went on too long. My apologies. Well, no, no. Um, and, and you've been saying, you started very vocally saying, um, like last summer, as, in, as an intellectual, someone who places a premium on brilliant thinking, you know, you, you said right now, courage is the most important thing. It's more important than, than brilliant thinking. And, um, and just taking a stand, setting an example, cur- courage being infectious. Um, so yes, and so here we are. And over the years, Jeffrey, you and I, uh, we've done many things, <laughs> lots of crazy things. Uh, together, going back to my days uh, working at Dole Food Company, but you know when I kind of came back into the uh, the think tank world, we've done many different interviews, um, including some even where you <laughs> donned white tails to interview Ayn Rand. Uh, but the last interview that you and I did was um, in July of 2020. Again, that was our, our eighth interview in this weekly series. Uh, And since then, you've been an atlas uh, upholding actual science and enlightenment uh, values against the the irrationality and authoritarianism uh, and brutality of lockdowns and mandates. Uh, You've written this book. Um, You've authored countless other articles, uh, making your case, uh, many of which have been be published and promoted with your gracious permission by the Atlas Society. Um, 
and you founded the Brownstone Institute. Yes. Uh, so now many of our viewers are familiar with the Brownstone Institute, of but course. still relatively new, right. uh, and some may not be. So we'd love it if you would just tell us a bit about it, yeah. how we came together, uh, and why you as a, a Renaissance man, we were just joking before in times past, written about all kinds of things, manners and fashion. And, yeah, yeah. Um, but you ever, that, yeah. That, it's funny we were reminiscing about that uh before the interview began about the the old days because yeah you know, i mean it was kind of seems frivolous um but you know the, the okay. unfrivolous thing about it was that we are here on earth to enjoy our lives and to to take care of what has been handed down to us yeah, and, yeah. and to accomplish our objectives so but you know, as, as somebody with more interests than anybody I know, you've chosen to focus all of your energies on this yeah. pivotal fight. So tell yeah. us about the Brownstone. Well, so I just, I feel like, you know, so it's really interesting to talk about because I love frivolity and I'd rather be a silly person. You know, uh, I'd rather write about why men should wear t-shirts and, and drink absinthe and hold doors for women and all the things, <laughs> you know. Drink bourbon We're for fighting to make the world safe for silliness. Exactly. I want to. I want to be that one. I, I want to rediscover that that guy again. But um, but at the same time, you know, uh, I, I feel like everything's prepared me for this. You know, everything in my whole life's prepared me for this, and that that everything that happened to me before March twenty twenty was a kind of um, a preparation to do some something really important. And I, you know, you held out that book, and that book is kind of an interesting book because it's it, a lot of it is the, the history of epidemics and uh, and uh, you know a social theory of, of pathogens and and how we integrate our learn to integrate ourselves within the presence of, of uh, biological threats you know over the last several hundred years and, and public health issues and all these things that I just frantically uh, tried to learn and understand um, the reason I tried to understand them is because you know it's, it's like you you know you you believe in, in freedom uh as a fundamental principle that doesn't mean we understand every single aspect of what that implies you know but you're really sure that freedom is probably better than any other alternative right so you're not you're not too inclined to say oh here's a new thing that's come along maybe i'll just we should put freedom on hold right you know but so i wanted to learn about the relationship between infectious disease and the idea of human rights you know i mean how do they how do they mix? And I was very pleased. I had no doubts about it. You know, to come out on the end of these studies, the realization that these things um, work together. You know, that in the presence of a pathogen, a new virus, as they say, uh, the best the best possible approach you could have is 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 to is to grant human rights to to um, to permit normal social functioning to use science and intelligence. You know, to to give good public health. Uh, uh, reasons for why people who might be vulnerable to this virus uh, should should uh, you know temporarily uh, lay low and and forego the Justin Bieber concerts and so on. You know, but this is what science would have told us, right? And this is what we did in 68, 69, 57, 58 throughout a century of public health. So I didn't understand why we were taking this other direction. In any case, I, I, you're right. I did become obsessed with the topic. I think it's the most important topic. I think it's more important than business cycle forecasting or practically anything other, anything else. But I just realized there was a dearth of information about this out there. And I also saw, so Brownstone then was founded for this purpose, to, to be a, a source of information, to integrate the ideals of human rights and freedom with uh, the the urgent need for uh, public health priorities and how those you know fit together, but more than that, I think I think the last two years have taught us something really important that we need sanctuaries, you know that that we need places of of freedom of speech and uh, for science to thrive, you know, uh, places to rescue in the times of political purges, the dissidents, just like Mises benefited from, from Geneva's uh, sanctuary, uh, I, I saw that Brownstone needed to be there, as is the Atlas Society, for dissident voices to give, to give them a platform, to give them basically uh, a freedom uh, to, to speak and to research and to write, and that there weren't enough of those places in the world. So Brownstone was, 
was founded with that idea in mind. You know, I would love to live in a world in which liberty and freedom were permanently protected, you know, where every intellectual could speak his mind or her mind, you know, where human community and, and uh, reason, you know, was always prevailing. Unfortunately, that's not the case, you know. Uh, we always have to fight for these ideals and we need institutions that are there, protect them and guide them and guard them and preserve them, even in times of great danger. So that, that, was, that was the idea of Brownstone. And I have to say it's working very well. So uh, as I mentioned, um, we had an interview. It's been a year and a half. Uh, it's held up remarkably well. We're gonna put that link in the comment section. Uh, we excerpted uh, little video clips and, and scattered those around the, uh, the, the web. But again, I mean, a lot has happened. Um, when you look back you know, over the past year and a half, are you, um, have you been surprised by new developments? Uh, have have your, your kind of initial instincts been confirmed? And, um, and, and where, where do we, what have been the biggest things yeah. that you've learned? Uh, so that? I, so Jennifer, um, I, I'm not saying I'm going to say anything you disagree with, because I, I feel sure that we've shared the same mental space throughout this whole pandemic but please do please do we welcome disagreement and dissent no 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 at the atlas society so what what happened was when the lockdowns first happened i figured that everybody would recognize the mistake and within two weeks we all go back to normal when that didn't happen i thought after a month we'd all recognize the mistake we'd look at sweden say everything was fine right. we would discover the science we would read the science the new york times would broadcast the science you know uh, that there would be front page headlines about the demographics of, of the, the, the risk associated with this mm -hmm. thing, but about, the, about the collateral damage in lockdowns. Look at all the missed cancer screenings. You know, look at all the, the children lost learning for, 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 for not being in school and so on. And that, that the human conscience would at some point kick in and we'd re-embrace freedom, right? I thought for sure that was going to happen. And then... For, for, for whatever reason, you know, the, the lockdown, lockdowns really became a kind of a, what gamblers call a pot commitment. You know, you gamble on something and then it just kind of keeps going on. And, and it just kept not ending and kept not stopping. We went all the way to the election and then people thought, well, after Biden gets in charge, then the lockdowns went in. Well, then it got worse and we got the mask mandates and then the vaccines came along and it wasn't enough to have a vaccine choice, which I thought would calm, calm everybody down. You know, right. and we go back to normal. That didn't happen. Suddenly we had vaccine <laughs> mandates. And then it turns out the vaccines don't stop transmission or, or, or uh, infection, Actually, which, yeah. which is to say they don't contribute uh, to the public benefit of, of herd immunity and the eventual achievement of the endemic equilibrium. So that became, a you know, so it's just gotten like, I'd never expected it to just get worse and worse and worse. And then you have all these kind of grifters who've used the pandemic to get uh, to, 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 to just like an Atlas Shrugged, right? There's always these, these unprincipled people who use the crisis to uh, try to push their unprincipled uh, despotic aims on the, on the public. And that's exactly what we've, we've had throughout. And then, and, and, and then you have the speech controls, right? So that, that's been the other thing that's been shocking. I just read through just today, I just finished an article when we, um, when we just got on this interview, I'm finishing up an article on the YouTube's new terms of service, you know, which, right. which basically take full possession of science. So what, you know, and banning actual science, uh, really creepy stuff. So that has surprised me. It's, it's, I never expected it to last this long. You know, I, I didn't imagine it would, would turn into a full scale crisis of civilization. Although probably like you, I had uh, a sense that something had gone very wrong in March, 2020, and we didn't know what the future was gonna look like. So um, I'm just glad I pushed through it and, and making a contribution. Again, this is not a world in which I ever wanted to live. Uh, on the other hand, I think everything has prepared you and prepared me to, uh, to be voices in the struggle. And, and so many of our listeners feel the same way. It's, a, it's yeah. the obligation, as Mises said, it's the obligation of everybody, like right now, to throw yourself into the intellectual battle. Um, yeah, well, it's it's also, I mean, I know you were beside yourself. I mean, we, we, and aside from the interview that we did, we, we had, you know, 
get togethers on, on the, on zoom. And, and I was, I was sick to my stomach. I mean, I was not physically sick, but I felt like something really horrible that had taken hold that needed to be, but just in the same way that somebody who got sick and got immunity and now, you know, recovered, uh, maybe the fact that we went through that, we faced it, you know, we didn't evade it. We didn't minimize it. Um, and, uh, you know, we, without kind of um, being Pollyannish, just uh, said, how are we gonna fix this? What needs to be done? What's first, who does what? And, um, and, and what are some of the, the good things um, to you and far in between? Uh, and, and how do we multiply them? So, but one of the developments I, I did wanna also talk about because it was still three or four months out from our last conversation was the Great Barrington Declaration. And that's been huge. So- Oh, we, really? Yeah, so that, that had not happened yet. So maybe just uh -huh, uh -huh. talk a little bit about so I, uh, together and- Yeah, I hope I'm not betraying the confidences, but I, I just, uh, um, but I just had a conversation with Martin Kulldorff about this actually, this evening. In fact, he's here. Well, tell him we, he has to come on. We've been trying to get in touch with him. Not, not to, you know, right now, but. No, I don't, we'll see. But anyway, so we don't, it's hard, it's hard to know how important things are, you know, in, in the sweep of history. Like when they wrote the, when we, you know, when the Magna Carta was drafted, did they know that we'd still be talking about it now? You know, uh, Declaration of Independence, you know, did they know for sure that it was the Declaration of Independence, or did they think it was just a thing to throw off these stupid colonial powers, get, get the hell out of our country kind of thing? You know, we don't know. I think the, um, Scott Atlas said this in his new book. He thinks that the most important thing that comes out of this pandemic is the Great Branson Declaration. And, and actually, this pan, the pandemic policy response is, that I would say, the most important attack on freedom in our lifetimes. Uh, and is it possible? And I said this to Martin, you know, at the end of the 21st century, are people going to look back at the Great Barrington Declaration as the great act of scientific moral courage on behalf of reason and human freedom? You know, maybe. I think it's very possible because it's, it's a brilliant, brilliant, very important document. It was put together. Um, yeah, it was put together on a weekend in a conference I organized where that began it's just the idea of uh, some epidemiologists getting together to teach journalists about virology and uh, immunology, because the prevailing view at the time was that the reason the press was so bad is that uh, the reporters didn't know anything. Uh, we'd, <laughs> if we, we just assumed that people were- Yeah, gave them the facts. Yeah, yeah. give them the facts and then everything would be great. Uh, the conference happened, but uh, I, I tried to call a bunch of journalists, you know, and like Martin said, well, I'll call this guy, call this guy, call this guy. I called everybody and nobody would want to show up. So in the end, I only got three people, you know. Uh, one was a guy who writes really, continues to write great articles for The Atlantic. Um, another was a journalist for the British Medical Journal. And the other was John Tamney, whom I think you know from Real mm -hmm. Clear Markets. And those are the only three journalists who bothered to show up. Mm -hmm. So then it became a problem. It was like... This is a real crisis of civilization. What can we do? And uh, Martin really, um, with Sinatra and, and Jay Bhattacharya, really thought they just drafted the statement. And I remember sitting in the living room as the statement was being read out loud. And, you know, I, my contribution was minor, but like I would intervene at several points and go, I think you could phrase this slightly different. So I'm very proud of that. So I, I don't mind, you know, broadcasting that to your audience. Like, <laughs> It was my, you know, my five minutes of fame there. But um, you but, guys were vilified for it. I mean, you were called yeah. the well, the, death cult, I think. Yeah, well, the, the website came out, you know, practically overnight, you know, thanks to a great web developer's name. I don't know if he wants it to be known. It certainly should be known. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's it was so strange, Jennifer, because... Um, they said the scientists believed that they were making very plain statements of ninth grade style cell biology combined with conventional wisdom concerning public health. That was it. It wasn't anything complicated. It wasn't anything radical. It was just when the pathogen comes along, 
You should treat the people who are sick, protect those people who could uh, face severe consequences of it, but otherwise allow the immune system to, to scale up and create endemicity. I think I'm fairly, and otherwise, allow, if you disable markets and disable society, you're going to create uh, greater harms. I, I think I'm properly characterizing the document. That's basically what it said. And the, yeah, then it was like, wait, heretics, stone them. <laughs> no. <laughs> And it's so interesting because, you know, something similar happened to, uh, to Galileo when he wrote a very compelling defense of Copernicus, you know. Um, and eventually the church called him a heretic and, and exiled him, you know. But what's interesting about that, about that experience is that it wasn't just the Pope Urban VIII and his College of Cardinals. It was the scientific establishment that was wedded to this Ptolemaic, you know, view of the universe that really came after Galileo. They are the, the ones that actually you could argue, like did, this, did science capture the church or the church capture science? I don't know which is which, but it was certainly the case, you know, in October uh, 2020 with the Great Branton Declaration that it felt as if both the entire scientific establishment plus the entire government establishment plus the media and big tech and everything was against us, you know? Uh, so it was a ferocious fight and uh, an unforgettable uh, thing to have happened. Um, but I'm so, so proud of the scientists that they did it anyway. Well, uh, and you brought it together. Would you have predicted that we would now be on the verge of talking about uh, and, and moving towards new new lockdowns in various parts of, of the world? I mean... No, it's unbelievable. It, does, and, it just doesn't seem like there's any acknowledgement of the destruction, you know, that they've caused. Yeah. So what's Fauci going on? Called, Fauci yes. called the Great Branson Declaration ridiculous, and that's that, you know, it's just awful. And so that was supposed to be the end of it. Um, but no, it keeps it keeps going on. They've got concentration camps now in Australia. Where they're dra dragging people out through track and trace. Anybody who's been exposed to the virus gets thrown into the concentration camps, and they're policing them now. And and uh, policing them for runaways and escapees. They put them in uh, paddy wagons and drag them back and beat them. And Austria is now uh, fully locked down again with very high cases, very high vaccination rates. And uh, they're fining people and uh, threatening criminal penalties for people who don't get the vaccine, even though uh, the vaccine is not stopping transmission or infection. So it's just so strange, Jennifer, it's like, there's something really, really off about the entire policy response here. It, 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 it's like masks, you know, or the, the vaccine mandates. It's, people just want some, they, they believe that there's some magic trick to, to making the pathogen go away, you know, uh, and that there's some policy level you can push, some amount of human compulsion and coercion that can, that can, that can cause uh, the infectious disease to just just to leave us all alone, you know, and that's just not, it's un, it's untrue. Uh, it's it's just not the case. We're going to have to deal with uh, our natural immunities. We're going to have to deal with endemicity and the demand for it. We have to deal with the presence of pathogens in the world and and start to normalize our experience with the with infectious disease. Uh, uh, yeah. some, something's gone very wrong, I would say. And it's and, just and people it, like, if people sneeze or if they have a cold, it's just, it's like uh, the end of the world. It, it, there's something strange that's happened. Have you, uh, let me ask you a question. Did you ever read Schumpeter's book uh, from, I think, 1946 called Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy? Um, I read it maybe twice, but it's been too long. And I don't know if it's, I'm if you're the kind of reader I am. I, I sometimes like when I read a book in the past, I only read it from the framework that I was in at the time, but that I need to reread it in light of the new information so I can get new information. But one of the things he said in that book was that the capitalism has a tendency to eat itself because it creates such prosperity yep. and such comfort and such leisure uh, and such safety. Um, that people began to take it all for granted and, and then lose track of like what caused it, what brought it about. So we began to sort of play with fire, I guess you could say. Like we began to toy with the idea that we could just shut down the economy, shut down society, and we could still preserve all the things uh, that from which we benefit. Something like that seems to have happened over the last uh, couple of years, you know? 
um, where this one third of workers who could work from home just said, oh, to hell with the other two thirds, let them, let them deal with the pathogen. We're going to stay, stay home, stay safe. And we're going to shut down supply chains. Who cares? Shut down shipping. No, oh, you know, forget it. Uh, reserve the hospitals only for the COVID patients, you know, who cares about cancer screenings, whatever. We became like, like tremendously irresponsible, <laughs> I would say. Yes. And our, and our sort of conception of how society works, like it requires everyone working together. Yeah. Complicated. No, was... Like they have to be preserved. You, you can't just shut down schools. You can't just shut down uh, the synagogues and the churches. I mean, this is not the way where you can't shut down the AA. Uh, sessions, you know, you just you can't do, you can't do these things and expect life to just go on as normal. Life is not normal. We had a hundred thousand deaths from drug drug overdoses over the last twelve months. You know, I mean, this is this is grim, huge, ghastly costs to these lockdowns and these mandates. There's millions of people now faced with the possibility of losing their jobs. Hilarious, well, it's not hilarious. None of the stuff's hilarious, but I don't know if you looked at the data about vaccination rates among uh, food inspectors. So like a hundred years ago, we decided the federal government should be in charge of food inspection, right? Which I think was a mistake. I mean, private enterprise doesn't want to sell you poison food. No. We, didn't, we never needed these dumb laws in the first place, but we've got them. We've had them for a hundred years. Well, the meat inspectors uh, and the poultry inspectors are, are typically rural people that live in the communities where the meat is processed in agricultural communities and in places that you and I have never been, like Idaho, Iowa, in the, you know, I don't even know how to pronounce these places, but anyway, <laughs> the rural, rural places over there. Um, and so the, that's where all the inspectors, live. well, it, you know, something like 75 or 80% of them are unvaccinated, why? Because, because most of them have natural immunities, right? They're exposed to pathogens all the time. They work in livestock. They, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the legend of the milkmaids. Why were their faces so clear? They never got smallpox because they were exposed to, to cowpox, right? You know that. Mm -hmm. um, so these food inspectors are, are, are uh, believers in natural immunity. They understand, they don't believe uh, Fauci. They, they understand that, you know, we evolved to coexist with these uh, viruses. So, so they're unvaccinated. Well, if the vaccine mandates go through, they're all gonna lose their jobs because they got better things to do than go inspect meat. If that happens and the meat inspectors stop showing up, they can't ship the, they can't package and ship the meat. You know, you're gonna go to the grocery store and not get chicken. You're not gonna get beef. You're not gonna get pork. What happens when the meat's not on the shelves? So these things are all connected. You can't just mandate something and expect there to be no consequences to it. It's just this crazy stuff. We've got people in charge of our lives who don't understand anything about the interconnectedness of, 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 of social structures and market structures. And it's very, very dangerous. But, uh, and I'm gonna get to some questions now because people are gonna get mad at me and we've got about 20 minutes uh, left and I, okay. there's so many things that well, I- Well, also I've been talking about. too much. You, you, no, you, not at all. <laughs> you perfect me long, perfect long answers for us to <laughs> excerpt time code okay. and post out there. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. But, uh, but one of the things on the positive side is, is these, these worldwide protests. Now, mm -hmm. it, it seems like there's been a near uh, universal blackout of coverage, but I'm, I'm not a big connoisseur of, uh, I'm not watching a lot of these news programs. Um, but why the disinterest? Uh, in, first of all, am I right about it? Um, or is that just paranoid? And uh, what are what are their significance in terms of rolling back the tide of some of these irrational and authoritarian policies? So, so did you say why the disinterest on the right? No, uh, the disinterest on the part of the mainstream media. You know that yeah. I mean we're 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 seeing them, but I I don't think uh, that there's any near the amount of coverage of them. Um, is it just because people don't, you know, the, the same media that's been telling us uh, that, you know, you're going to die and um, these, these policies are for your own good, don't want to acknowledge that there's a reaction or? I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't entirely know. I know individual reporters just kind of go along with what the, whatever their editors say and the editors go along with whatever their publishers say and the publishers go along with whatever the advertisers want. And I don't really understand it. I mean... I ran an article about two weeks ago that was nothing but about 
30 uh, videos of protests all over the world. Uh, and yes, that article went viral because people were really happy to see people protesting in Zurich and Botswana and you know, uh, Spain and you know, uh, Paris and Rome, and London, so on. It's very interesting to watch, but it, I mean, I asked myself the question when I posted that article, is this the largest global protest movement um, in my lifetime or maybe in history? I mean, it might, it, might, it might be. And yet the New York Times mentions nothing about it. Right, that's what and, I'm getting at. I, you know, and so, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused by it. I, I don't understand why an article on Brownstone would suddenly get you know, 250,000 views because we're just doing nothing but reposting Twitter mm -hmm videos of protests. And I see that Twitter has come out with new terms of use in which you cannot post a video of people without their permission. Okay, so, so under the new Twitter terms of use, none of those videos can, can even uh, re remain. So you can't even stick an iPhone out your window and show people hmm. on the street. That's gonna be banned by Twitter, so. Or what about taking photos of, of, of an arrest or you know police brutality or something like that? That's really bizarre. It's really right. bizarre, but we're, we're coming to some very scary times. I think starting in January, we're going to see social media just basically almost shut down entirely. Uh, mainstream social media. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to jump over to some of these questions. And um, Jeffrey's Twitter handle is Jeffrey A. Tucker on on Twitter. So um, he does dip in there. So it's a wonderful uh, feed to follow. But um, if I don't get to all of the questions if we can't answer all of them. I'll try uh, to be short too in my answers. Try to be really okay. quick. And I'll try to get ones that are that are we haven't covered and that are pretty straightforward. So P Page on Instagram asks, uh, are Mr. Tucker's books available in French? In French, yeah. I've got I think I've got a couple of books in French. I'm missing my, my book on right-wing collectivism is available in French and probably bourbon for breakfast. I don't know what the French title is, but you should check it out. I don't know. Has, um, has Liberty or Lockdown been translated yet? Um, yeah, Liberty Lockdown is in Portuguese. Uh, okay. Because Portuguese and not Chinese, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but Portuguese, it's in Portuguese now. Maybe and maybe there's a, a German. Well, you, you know what I'm going to say. My vote is I'm waiting for the audio version. So, oh, you know, I worked on that so hard. Have you ever done an audio book, Jennifer? We do them all the time. You know, that was the, the first thing when I came to the Atlas Society. I, was, I looked at their library. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm never going to get through all of this. I know we have a new uh, project. We're going to put all of our Atlas Society publications on Audible. So, yeah, we know how to do it. Maybe, we can help. Maybe, maybe Brownson will just contract with you. You could do all my audio books. I <laughs> I, I, I tried. And we'll contract you with you for your article. Yeah, right? But I, I, I tried to do an audio book of Liberty Lockdown, uh, uh, but it took so much time and only got halfway through the book. It's exhausting. It's an exhausting. Yeah. Well, let's talk off offline on that because you can yeah. just, um, the best thing to do is, is to use the system to, uh, to, to get a, a narrator. They have wonderful narrators. You can choose all oh, kinds audible? of pages. And, huh? Audible? Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Well, let's, yeah, let's talk offline. I should work with you on this. Yeah, I agree. Because, yeah, you know, we have a book. May I go get this book real quick? Hold on. Yeah. Sorry, guys. It's just uncontrollable. So this is, this is a book. So when I got this book, this is the Great COVID Panic. And, I, you know, uh, when I got this book, so they first lied about the risks of work. Then they assumed that workers would say, stay away from their jobs. Anyway, just as often as government mandates required, all they had to do now. So you know, this I'm reading the book already. But this is a great book. This but, is by the by uh, mm -hmm. Brownstone Institute. Yeah. So what happened was I was considering founding the Brownstone Institute, and I thought we really need a publisher to put out great work on this topic. That's not a commercial publisher or an academic publisher, because mm -hmm. commercial publishers turn everything into politics. Academic publishers turn everything into tedium. So that's the reason a nonprofit publisher exists. So I got this book on email and I read it, I stayed up the entire night, right? Like reading the book because I thought it was so brilliant. Uh, the, the authors were brutal with me. They gave me only six weeks to get it into print. But this book has sold so many copies and it's been so wonderful and I'm so thrilled by it. I still think it's overall the best book on the topic, actually. Okay. Is that an, an Audible? 
It is not, right? Okay, so well, let's not. get that. Uh, well, Jennifer, you're going to help me. You're gonna... I am going to definitely help you, but I have a price. So <laughs> I'm not going to trade. I'm not going to give you something. You're, you're not a um, communist? Okay. So, uh, but anyway, uh, let, we'll get that link to that book mm. also up um, in, awesome. in, the, okay. in the chats. Uh, our senior scholar, Professor Richard Salzman, asks, um, agree, or maybe he is just agreeing, the Great Barrington Decla Declaration will prove crucial in, in time if we retain some semblance of liberty in the future. Yeah, well, Salzman is a great, great man. And uh, he's a, a scholar with you? Yes, yes, he's our, he's our senior scholar. Uh, he does our uh, morals really? and markets. He does a Instagram takeover. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. And, and a great uh, uh, anti-lockdowner, but not only that, but a monetary economist and has been warning about the, the inflation that's coming. Uh, I admire him so much. I mean, he's just a great man and uh, I appreciate his comments very much. So Mary T on Instagram says, thoughts on the federal judge blocking the vaccine mandate for health workers? Or maybe, you know, kind of expanding no, no. on that. I, I will tell you that, that with, to, to all these court decisions that are coming out, and many of them are... are, are fast are, and furious. Yeah, I, I interviewed the, pla the plaintiff for uh, the Missouri decision the other day that, that like wiped out the whole... I don't know if you saw this decision, but it wiped out the whole of COVID restrictions. So they're like, this will violate the separation of powers and the equal protection of, of the law. It was a great decision. It said, you can't have health bureaucrats, you know, telling people what to do. This is dumb. So it was a brilliant decision. It applied the whole of Missouri and a very important decision. Even the secretary of state of Missouri said, okay, we're going to acquiesce to this decision. I interviewed the plaintiff on that. Just a regular mom who's like, you know, just, just, you should please watch that interview because it's just it's so powerful and inspiring. It shows how regular people can make a difference. But here's the hell of it, Jennifer, and what upsets me so much. Do you know that the New York Times never even reported on that court decision, never wrote a single article That's about it? That's insane. Not even one, even though it's this very important, decisive mandate that affects, like, you know, you know St. Louis, and, you know, it's, a, it's like, it's a huge, didn't, to this day, the New York Times not reported on. So there's another court decision that came out today, I think out of Louisiana, then the Fifth Circuit Court, you know, about uh, the vaccine mandates. They're, they're coming in by the day. But here's the question. If the New York Times doesn't report it, does it happen? I mean, like, it's, it's weird. We've got the courts basically on our side. But after that Fifth Circuit uh, decision came out about the vaccine mandates, that, that Jen Psaki, whatever, that lady who's mm -hmm. for the, the uh, regime, Right. Uh, said, no, you should continue to Just do it anyway. Yeah, do these, do these uh, things anyway. And you're probably in the same situation I'm in. I'm getting a lot of invitation to Christmas parties, right? And everybody's like, oh, only fully vaccinated people allowed. Okay, so the courts are striking down uh, these kind of exclusionary segregationist uh, things, but people are ignoring it. So I don't know. I mean, the courts are finally starting to work but they're, they're not yet having an, an effect, but I think eventually they will. Okay, uh, Roger Bissell asks, considering how many people died because of these policies uh, who wouldn't have otherwise have died, uh, like delayed treatment for operations, spare suicides, et cetera, in order to save some lives from COVID, would it be appropriate to call this a redistribution of death or is that uh, too inflammatory a way to describe these policies? Um, there's no question that there is a class element here. The ruling class, um, and I'm sorry for my language here, but the ruling class definitely decided to preserve, protect itself and put the, the working classes and the poor in the way of the virus, in which is what they used to do in the ancient world. You know, we're the clean people, let the dirty people get the pathogen. And that is definitely a redistribution of death. I mean, that was an attempt to, uh, uh, I'm gonna preserve my life at your expense. I don't, I don't think it actually worked. I don't think the locked, lockdowns have done any good for anybody. There's a really uh, powerful story and you're a, you're a big Edgar Allan Poe fan, I think, but there's a powerful story of a Prince Prospero who decided to go into the castle and protect himself against uh, the pathogen that was outside. Eventually he holds this big masked ball because he, he thought like New Zealand, they had gotten rid of it. 
but in the middle of the ball, uh, a scary kind of figure in a cloak, you know, shows up and it turns out to be the virus who attacks mm-hmm you know, everybody at the ball and Prince Prospero and they all die. So so I don't think that this kind of ruling class uh, efforts to protect yourself from the pathogen really ultimately uh, uh, work, especially when you do it at other people's expense. Ayn Rand said, um, you should never, you should only live for yourself and but and doing not so, sacrifice yourself to others and not, not sacrifice, sacrifice others and, and, to yourself. Yeah, make other people sacrifice themselves for you. Uh, so it goes both ways, and that's what we've done here. We've there are a certain class of people have asked other people to sacrifice their lives and their safety so they can be safe. This is this is cruel, and uh, it's 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 contrary to, to ethics as as Rand understood uh, mm-hmm. that term. So we have a couple of questions coming in here. Uh, Carl Carlson and others asking about inflation. Uh, Carl asking with the Reserve Federal Reserve bankrolling levels of uh, irresponsible spending, has that impacted messaging for small government advocates? Uh, I think also questions about um, inflation and the argument of certain people who say, well, buying's up too. People are buying a lot of things. And doesn't that mean that, you know, they're buying it despite government inflation? I think you've argued that it might be because of government inflation and uh, the yeah. possibility of moving forward yeah. towards what uh, Mises called the crack up boom. Okay, boom. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is a complicated topic. It's like most supply and demand models are, are based on a kind of a, what, what's called a Cheteris cider, cider, Peribus model where everything else stays the same, but inflation expectations can change that, right? So uh, your velocity will tend to um, collapse velocity of money, which is the pace at which transactions uh, take place during a crisis because people get risk averse. But once they realize their dollars are going to be worth less in the future, they tend to go out and spend them regardless of the high prices. In fact, if you believe the prices are going to get higher and higher, you have an incentive to really go out there and spend as much money as possible now before the dollars are worth less and take on more debt. So I, we're, we're right in this in-between point, because if you look at velocity statistics, it's historically uh, low, uh, reflecting the crisis mentality. But if you, but if you look at um, uh, the, the the change in, in consumer behavior right now, we're seeing uh, gradual increases in people spending more in light of inflationary expectations. My point is, this can get out of control really fast. By out of control, I mean to say that the Fed cannot control it. I mean, so right now, like if you look at the equation of exchange, there are four pieces to it. The one piece the Fed cannot control is the V or the velocity of money. That's the one that's heavily dependent upon consumer behavior and expectations. That's the variable that's going to change us from being, you know, tolerable levels of high inflation to like impossible levels of catastrophic inflation. The Fed cannot control that. And this is what gives us you know, memories of Weimar at this point. Uh, so it's, it's actually quite scary. The other thing to remember, and I'm going to stop about this topic because we could make this a whole uh, uh, podcast in itself, but inflation doesn't occur like like sea levels. It's not just CPI or PPI. There's there's huge inflation in some areas and, and less, less in other areas. But the point is that every single sector, even the sectors that were deflationary for the last 25 years are now going up in price by which I mean software, hardware, uh, computers, uh, component parts, and that sort of thing. So, and, and, and to say nothing of prices of cardboard, which are up 75% year over year, you know? It's really getting scary, Jennifer. Well, uh, we are coming up on the end of this hour. Um, we've got maybe five more minutes. I am detecting, looking back at our previous interview, I am detecting some of the the old Jeffrey, the the ebullience, <laughs> the mischief, uh, and maybe some uh, some of some optimism a little bit more than when we spoke back in in July of twenty. Must have been awful back then. I don't remember that, but I think. No, well, oh yeah, you were so awful. We're just like completely, you know. <laughs> spreading your memes all over the place. No, you were, we're, we're milking it for every, you know, ounce of insight. But, um, I, you know, you, we have a long struggle, a hard struggle uh, ahead of us. But is there a sense in which you're, you're more optimistic 
now that that we can and and we will win that struggle? Well, I will I will tell you I'm very grateful uh, to you um, for being persistent, being determined, to for using your intuition and to you know looking deep within yourself and going what do I believe in? And you you did that. You said I believe in freedom. I believe in free. I don't be able to understand all the ins and outs of you know, immunology and epidemiology, but I, I think freedom is right and it's true. And you stuck your neck out and the Atlas Society said unpopular things, uh, uh, things that were radical. We lost, we lost some donors, unfortunately. We lost some donors. We lost some donors and some audience, you know, but but the thing is you, you, you stuck to what was right and true. And I think you're, you're vindicated as a result of it. And to me, the kind of courage that you uh, that you acted upon and that you steered Atlas Society to to speak for is is exactly what's going to get us out of this crisis. You know, uh, moral courage is very powerful. It's much more powerful than like guns or health bureaucrats or, or politicians. Those people just come and go. But 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 courage is is a spiritual thing, and uh, it's it's uh, indefatigable. It, it can't be overcome. You know, once you decide to be courageous and to believe in something and to stick to it, no matter what, um, the world, the powers that be are, become afraid. And, and they eventually acquiesce. They eventually give in. Not right away. Not, not today. Not next week. Not next month. But eventually... Moral courage is very, very powerful, much more powerful than all of their guns, all of their press conferences, and even all of their social media platforms. Uh, the, the power of truth cannot be underestimated. In fact, here's the thing. It's all we have, and it's also what works best. So we've got all the advantages, but it requires people like you, and it requires the Atlas Society to stick up and say what's true regardless of the consequences. So, you know, God bless you, forgive the phrase, but I, I think you've done the right thing and I'm I, glad to be an ally with you. I would, would approve. Uh, I, I know in the, in the darkest days <laughs> when I went up to help take care of my parents in San Francisco and it was just madness, you know, um, I, uh, I, the one thought that saw me through is, well, reality does exist. <laughs> <laughs> it, there is a re the reality, there is a reality. Yeah. And, you know, eventually one way or another, it will, you know, you have, you're free to ignore reality, but not the consequences. Well, you're, you're, an, you're an implausible reincarnation of, of, um, of Cicero uh, and Augustine and uh, several other uh, 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 big figures in history. But I think, I think your, your words are very powerful and your, your presence and, and, and the internet um, and your presence in with the Out Society has been uh, essential to this fight. So I think you're doing great work and that's a pleasure to be involved in the struggle with you. It does make it a lot more fun. And I uh, want to also, all of you, I know we've got a lot of donors who are watching and people who've supported our work. I would invite you to please go and visit uh, the brownstoneinstitute.org. Yeah. You should no, definitely- it's, it's Actually, I paid a lot of money for this uh, domain, brownstone.org. <laughs> no, brownstone case okay. brownstone.org put right. it we're going to put it in the comment section uh sign up for their newsletter um follow them on social media and uh and you know he he is the leader he has been the, the leader and uh, i'll never forget back uh, in the day I, I don't remember who it was but clearly there were a lot of libertarian groups that were were not uh coming out in, in strongly in favor of, uh, of individual rights and against lockdowns. And as they, they started to kind of say, you know, move closer to your direction, somebody I think said, well, don't go all Jeffrey Tucker on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I was definitely held up as the, the, the black beast of the anti yes. for a long time. I don't time. mean to go all Jeffrey Tucker, but well, yeah, we, do mean, we, we do mean to go all Jeffrey Tucker. Yeah. So um, thank you, Jeffrey, for all of your work. I, let me just echo that. I think I think investing in the Atlas Society is a great expenditure of money. It's way more important than the dinners and the vacations and everything else. 
we need to use our resources to to back principled positions because because civilization is at stake. And I'm, I, you know, we we sometimes said that in the past. No, it really is like it's this is it. This is our moment. This is the time. This is it. This is we're our, on. Struggle for <laughs> five hundred years of progress are are hanging in the balance. And another reason to invest in the Atlas Society is because you get a lot of bang for your buck. And as a matter of fact, in 30 minutes from now, I'm going to be on Clubhouse with another senior scholar, uh, Stephen Hicks. We're, we're going to be talking about is capitalism good or bad for the environment? So and, uh, and then next week uh, on Tuesday again with our senior fellow, um, Rob Trusinski, talking about uh, robotic technology and whether or not it's going to wipe out white collar jo jobs. And another interview that I'm very excited about a week from today is with Eric Prince, who's the founder of Blackwater and mm -hmm. a untold Ayn Rand fan. So a lot of good stuff coming up. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Bye, everybody.